everyone. Dylan from the Smart Economy Podcast. We have Charles Guillaume, the CTO at Ledger. How's it going today, Charles? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm really excited to delve into this conversation. I myself have been a long-term Ledger user since basically day one in crypto mm-hmm. for me, which has been about seven years now. But I don't want to talk about me. I want to hear about your Genesis story. So how did you end up building in the blockchain and crypto space? Ah, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, my background is uh, cryptography and security, and uh, those are topics I'm interested in since I'm 12. When I got a computer, the first thing I started to do was to try to understand how these things work, and if it's possible to break them. I spent maybe a decade <laughs> to do like hacking, like this kind of stuff. And after that, I studied mathematics, computer science, and cryptography, and I worked in this area for uh, 15 years. I discovered Bitcoin in 2011. Uh, at this time, a friend of mine was mining with his own computer. And then I studied uh, crypto- the cryptography, the, the technology itself, the centralized consensus, all of this, but I didn't really get the use case. I was like, this thing is interesting, but what's the use case? Right. And I finally understood when I joined Ledger in, in 2017, that, and I, I, for me, the biggest value proposition for Bitcoin and crypto in general is the permissionless aspect. And we are at the permissionless conference, so it resonates well. <laughs> So when you first saw Bitcoin, were you like, how can I break this? Or did you just kind of look at it and then look past it? No, yeah, definitely. When, when I studied the, the Bitcoin protocol, I was like, oh, there, there must be something to hack. But I uh, didn't think, I didn't find something obvious. I thought that was elegant, like the, the solution was good. And, uh, but again, I didn't get the use case. <laughs> now, yes. But, at this time, I didn't get it. So then how did you end up at Ledger? If you're still not like a crypto degen or, or you know, seeing the use case for sending a peer-to-peer money across the world, how did you end up at a hardware wallet provider? Yeah, uh, so again, uh, I was deep in cryptography and security. And I, I was um, working in, in a big company. I was heading a security, security evaluation lab. So again, security, hardware, all of this. Mm-hmm. And there was this uh, small startup uh, in Paris and I, I really like startup because everything is like um, more uh, more frenzy, more uh, the, the ambiance is really um, uh, different in startup. I really like this, and um, I also really like the ambition, ambition for Ledger and so on. Um, and about crypto and blockchain, I, I was not so sure because that was still the the, the story around the Silk Road and all of this that was uh, not that far uh, away. But I, I like the technology, so I, I really came for the technology and for the project. That's awesome. And so did you kind of get your start at Ledger did, as working for the company or were you working with Don John first? So uh, when I joined the company uh, in 2017, that was a small, small startup, only 45 people, and uh, there was no security department. Mm-hmm. And my first mission was to uh, create the security department. And then I created the dungeon, and uh, the dungeon is our security research team. And their main mission is um, is really to raise the bar for security across the, the ecosystem, and uh, and mostly uh, improve the security of Ledger products. So what they try to do is really to break our product day after day. <laughs> and uh, sometimes they find small vulnerabilities, sometimes bigger vulnerabilities, but they always find something. And then they work with the, the engineering team in order to uh, find a way to, uh, to, to improve it. So this is what I uh, did first. After that, I created the certification team because I, I was like, we, we are selling security, but anyone uh, tried to sell security, but how can you provide evidence? It's mm-hmm. easy to claim stuff, but... And uh, as I was coming from the security evaluation world, the certification, I thought that was a good idea to go through a security uh, evaluation to obtain certification. And this is what we did. We went through evaluation for our devices and uh, every product we have. We obtained certification. And uh, in 2019, I became a CTO. That the company was growing. And, um, and security is very important to everything we do at Ledger. So it was uh, obvious for Pascal that uh, I should lead the, the overall technology. Yeah, and so when during your tenure at Ledger then did it click for you like this is what the value of cryptocurrencies and digital assets are? Yeah, I, I, as, I, as I mentioned, when I joined, that was not so obvious, but, <laughs> but slowly now I'm completely convinced. I, I truly believe like the permissionless aspect of crypto is a very powerful tool. And for me, it's, it made, it's made possible uh, by two things. 
first, first of all, uh, self-custody. Mm -hmm. If you're not self in self-custody, why crypto at the end? Uh, self-custody gives the power to the user. And secondly, the decentralized consensus. And, uh, and this part is also equally important. And sometimes I feel we tend to forget this a little bit uh, because we want to solve other problems such as scalability and, uh, and all of this in, uh, in blockchain. But yeah, these two things are really important to make users sovereign over their things, over their data, over their uh, money uh, and all of this. And I, I think this is really uh, powerful. And when you think really deeply about that, you realize that uh, this object like crypto, Bitcoin is, uh, is, not, a, is not a detail, it's not, it's not something uh, about speculation. Yes, there are speculation. But this is not the, the, the purpose. The purpose is really to empower users. So with the advent of so many L1s, so many different verticals, DeFi, NFTs, so many different use cases, how has your perspective on being the CTO and focusing on security uh, at Ledger, how has that changed or grown with the ways that people use blockchain over the few years that, over the past five years that you've been a CTO? Uh, yes, so at the beginning there, there was Bitcoin and, and only Bitcoin and now there are plenty of new use cases. And what changed a little bit uh, in, in the technology, the way we are uh, considering things, is um, we quickly understood that we couldn't, um, we couldn't afford uh, supporting all this protocol on our own. On our own. Mm -hmm. And then we decided to create open platforms. Uh, this device at the end is an open platform. Uh, inside there is a, an operating system and anyone can build his own app to build uh, the support of uh, his, his blockchain. Uh, today we are supporting, uh, I don't know, like 170 different blockchains. A lot. Uh, yeah, a, a lot. Most of them have been built by uh, the foundation because we, we are an open platform and we are uh, encouraging anyone to build uh, some uh, application on top of our devices. This is the, the same for Ledger Live. Uh, again, we have uh, opened um, the Ledger Live for uh, third-party developers. For instance, uh, when Solana wants to be inclu included in Ledger Live, they come to us, they uh, implement the support, and then uh, it's supported in, in Ledger Live. So, so what does that support look like? So like, let's say I'm a Solana dev, or I'm a SUI dev, or I'm a new blockchain dev, and yeah. I want to have support, support from my chain added to Ledger. What's kind of like the process that looks so, like? Uh, first of all, yeah, there is a website, a, develop, uh, a website portal, uh, de developers.ledger.com, and then you have a, a different SDK according to what you want to build. There was an SDK for the app, uh, for building the application running on the device. Uh, for this, you need uh, some um, uh, embedded um, uh, skills, so because this is a low level C, but everything is well explained and so on. Then you can build your SUI app, for instance, to, have a, uh, to be able to sign a SUI transaction, receive SUI uh, on your uh, device. Um, so this is for the device part, and for Ledger Live, you um, you have to uh, start a discussion with our teams in order to un to understand what are our requirements in terms of um, of um, like UI and uh, all of this, so that everything is unified. And then uh, you will work with our team in order to integrate um, the support of SUI uh, inside Ledger Live, so that after that uh, our users are able to uh, send, receive, swap, buy, sell everything on, on Ledger Live. And that will be applicable to all of the Ledger devices, from Nano X and S to Stacks and Flex? Yeah, we, we have uh, created an SDK that, that tries to uh, abstract as much as possible the device itself so that you, you can focus only on the development of your application logic and not that much uh, to, on, the, on the device itself. So I've been using Ledger since 2017, and I've been using the, the Nano or the Ledger S. And so my experience is to use the little USB looking stick and to click the buttons on the top. Are you seeing that with the advent of Flex and Stacks, are you seeing kind of like OGs that are being maximalists about the Nano device? Or are you seeing a lot of folks getting really excited and eager to buy the new devices that were recently released? Um, there, there are a few folks that are a little bit nostalgic of the <laughs> Nano S. That's true, but I think this is really nostalgia because um, because they remember those old, old good old times. Yes. But at the end, they they use new devices, especially when you are like a, 
a frequent user that you uh, do a lot of transactions, that you are interacting with smart contracts on uh, Ethereum or L2 and so on. Having a larger device, uh, uh, being able to um, to understand what kind of transaction you are able to you are about to sign is really important. Um, on my side, I, I like uh, I do plenty of complex transaction, but also I. Uh, Quite often, I reset my device, I recover it, mm -hmm. and doing like a recover on this compared to doing a re recover on the, on the Nano, like it's uh, it's uh, day and night. Uh, yeah, you, uh, on the Nano, uh, if you want to recover your seed, I think you need at least five minutes if if you are used to used to do it. Uh, with this one, like it's less less than a minute and very uh, it's very sleek. Yeah, I'm probably doing over 200 clicks to recover a yeah, device. Yeah, totally. totally. <laughs> So when did you guys start conceptualizing a touchscreen device and how long did it take from coming up with the idea to releasing a product that you were satisfied with? Um, I think the, the beginning of the idea was probably like three years ago. Then we started to work on the, on the project two years ago. Um, and, uh, and then uh, that, was, uh, that was longer than expected, uh, mostly because we started with, um, with stacks. So uh, if, when you build stacks, you need to build the hardware itself. You need to do the porting of the operating system. You need to port the application, port the SDK so that everything uh, uh, can work on uh, every single device. You need to create experiences uh, in Ledger Live. You need to update your website. So all of this is a lot of work. But um, also there is something that is uh, also, equally difficult is uh, creating the manufacturing chain mm -hmm. uh, because um, when you do software, you don't think about, about this. But when you do hardware, there are also challenges in uh, creating uh, uh, physical devices. You need to find the, the right partner. You need to, to source the, the, the right uh, electronic components. Mm -hmm. And then you need to create this supply chain and the, the manufacturing itself. And this is where we had some challenges because we wanted to have like this curved screen um, and, and a lot of um, uh, uh, tiny specificities with, which made the, the manufacturing and the supply chain uh, like uh, more difficult than, than expected. So <laughs> that's why we yeah, we spent we spent some time with the stacks, and um, and now we are very proud to, to have it uh, on, on the market. Um, uh, it's uh, three ninety nine. And we wanted to have like the same type of experience with at, at a lower uh, price point, and then we decided to uh, use the same technology platform with the same secure element and all of this, but with at a lower price point. And this is when we created Flex, which is less challenging to manufacture, but uh, with a similar experience. At the end, the design is um, a little uh, less uh, slick than the, the the stacks, but it's uh, cheaper. So this is. Uh, this is what we did, and to to create this one that took nine months because we reused almost everything that we built on stacks, and uh, that was mostly like diff mechanical design that, that was a little bit different, and the supply chain and manufacturing that was really simple. So my favorite feature of the Flex and Stacks is that you can put uh, your own image on the lock screen. Yeah. What's one thing about the new devices that stands out to you that you really enjoy? Um, so yes, having uh, being able to put your own image as a background is uh, is, is quite fun. Uh, also, what, what is quite fun with uh, e ink screen is the fact that uh, now it's off, it's off, and it displays uh, an image. But it's off; it doesn't consume any energy because e wow. yeah, e ink screen has like um, they are they are B stable. So that means that they are stable when the the pixel is uh, white, but they are also stable when when the pixel is uh, is dark. Uh, which is not the case with uh, classical TFT. Mm -hmm. you, need, you need white. You need light to to have white. Right. And this is not the case for e-ink. So that that means now it's off, but there is still the, the image, and uh, it's quite it's quite fun to to, to have this. And there is something uh, something that uh, I personally really like is the fact they are magnets and you can stack them, and uh, I play with them like uh, every day, like uh, like a fidget. Yeah, it's super cool. Yeah. Um, so. What are the conversations you're having with like folks who are at the institutional or the enterprise level? What do they con have concerns about when it comes to like a hardware device to store their assets? Because especially if we're talking about institutions, there's new levels of stringency. There might need to be multi-factor authentication in case you know somebody who has access to these devices goes away. So what are the kind of like different considerations that go into providing security for like larger scale entities that maybe we don't have to deal with as a retail user? Yes, um, and 
you, you are totally right. These devices are perfectly secure and they uh, enable you to be in self-custody. But when you are an institution or a group of people, what does it mean, self-custody? Because uh, who, who owns the fund? Right. This is the company, this is the group of people, this is not one person. If, you, if, if one person has the pin of the device, then you can move all the funds without uh, any governance, and that would be very bad. And for, uh, in order to solve this problem, we created a product uh, for uh, institution and B2B in general, that is called uh, Ledger Vault. And uh, this is, a, it's not very well known in the retail, but uh, it's, a, it's a B2B product. And, it's, um, and the idea is really to provide a platform for institution, a uh, group of people who want to manage their uh, crypto uh, in security, mm -hmm. but with governance. That means that they will have a, they will, will have a, a, it's a SaaS platform, we are leveraging HSM, hardware security model. And then um, uh, in the organization, they will decide who is administrator, who is operator, and so on. Cool. Uh, each of these roles has a security device, um, a device like this. And, um, and then they will uh, decide what, what is the governance. For instance, they will say on this uh, Bitcoin account, um, you can, operators can make transaction up to a certain threshold. And if they want to, to do bigger transaction, they need three approvals out of five. Uh, this kind of, um, of uh, governance. Interesting. And uh, they decide this governance and uh, everything is uh, implemented at the HSM side and the operators and the administrator have security device to authenticate to the platform and to consent for, 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 for transaction and, and all of this. And um, we, it's, yeah, Ledger is very well known for retail, but uh, this product exists uh, almost for six years. Wow. And now we are working on a new feature for this um, uh, 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 institutional clients that is called TradeLink. And, uh, and TradeLink is a feature that um, enables hedge fund or trader to trade with different exchanges, but off exchange. Because there is a, a big counterparty risk when you are an enterprise. Uh, if you want to trade with Binance, let's say, and you want to trade with millions, right. uh, what you would need to do first is to send millions to Binance and then do your trade and then you can withdraw. And that creates a counterparty risk. And when you are an institution with uh, like a compliance um, requirements and this kind of thing, um, it's, it's not that good. And in, by the way, in traditional finance, that doesn't work like this. You do everything off exchange and, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and there is like a netting and settlement um, process afterwards. And then we have created this new product that's called Trailing that enables hedge fund and uh, exchanges and custodian to do this um, trading, but off exchange. So this is, uh, this is something that we are very proud of and that will be live like in the coming month. Very interesting. And I know that for the retail facing side, you guys just released two amazing new wallets, but what's next on the roadmap? What oh. are you going to be looking for next? Uh, there, there are plenty of things. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, I, I can only tease. So this, this year we uh, worked a lot on uh, supporting a lot of new protocols because we, there are new L1, uh, new protocols. And again, we want to be as open as, as possible and to make sure that uh, any any protocol is supported uh, on, on, Ledger, on Ledger devices and on Ledger Live. Uh, being able to buy, sell, swap, stake, earn, uh, all of this is, uh, is possible on, on Ledger Live and we will continue to enhance uh, this uh, support. I think like um, the earn part uh, should be uh, bigger in the future okay. because when you think about it, um, when, when you are a holder, uh, sometimes you have different type of uh, users, but some, some people are holders and, and they would like to get yield from uh, their crypto. And uh, this is uh, something that is already quite big uh, in the stable coin uh, space, but that is becoming uh, increasingly um, bigger in the Bitcoin space, for instance. So uh, there was something, uh, th this is something we are working on. Uh, also, there, was, there are a few uh, R&D projects that we are working on around um, account abstraction, for instance. This is something that is, uh, uh, that is uh, interesting for us. Also, when you think about that, um, this is, an, um, this is a, a standalone device and mm -hmm. on the other end you have your phone. And, and the ideal experience would be to have like the two devices in one, devices, in one device, uh, meaning that having um, a fun type of experience with the level of security uh, of Ledger. So I don't announce anything. I'm just saying that we are doing some R&D in order to solve uh, these uh, technical challenges here. 
Um, also, uh, on this device, um, I didn't mention it, you can connect it with uh, USB, you can connect it with uh, BLE, uh, Bluetooth, mm -hmm. uh, but there is another interface uh, in it, uh, which is NFC. Very cool. For now, we don't use it, but I can tease that we are working on some feature in order to use this interface also. So plenty of new things um, and um, stay tuned. So um, what are kind of, what's one main takeaway that you've had from this permissionless event? Um, one big takeaway I, I, I got, so again, the, the ecosystem is really vibrant, plenty of new protocols, plenty of uh, uh, new interesting uh, interesting things, especially over Ethereum with this L2, mm -hmm. um, the the chain abstraction ID, uh, account abstraction is uh, is now everywhere. But something that uh, that is really important is the fact that we see more and more um, people trying to create like Web2 type of experiences on top of um, DeFi, on top of Ethereum. There are plenty of uh, apps trying to do a Revolut with a Revolut interface, but on chain. And this, this, I think this is a pivoting moment because um, from the beginning of Bitcoin to now, it's still targeted for geeks, for nerds. Right. right? And we like to know that uh, this asset run on this L2 and to do the bridge, <laughs> you have to... But let's face it, when you think, when you talk with your mom and you explain, you explain her what you do, it's just like, what the hell are, are you talking about? Yeah. And, and removing all this... Um, uh, um, obstacle, the challenges, is, is important and I see more and more people trying to, uh, to tackle these uh, UX challenges and, uh, and uh, that was uh, really clear to me uh, here at, at Permissionless. Awesome. So if anybody's listening to this, uh, is psyched, what's the best way they can reach out to you and who do you want to be speaking with in particular? Um, again, uh, we, uh, we love to speak with uh, developers. Uh, if you want to build something of, uh, on top of Ledger, uh, please do. Uh, you can build uh, uh, application on devices, you can build the support of your protocol in Ledger Live. We have uh, announced a Ledger Keering protocol that enables anyone to create um, um, privacy preserving application uh, using our devices. So if you are a developer and, uh, and keen on uh, building on top of Ledger, please uh, reach out. You can reach out on developers.ledger.com. And if you want to reach out directly to me, uh, you can find me on Twitter. Um, uh, uh, searching for my name, Charles Guillaume, uh, and um, that's it. Charles, thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, thank you. It was good. Cheers. Cheers. If you guys want to catch any of the other interviews we've had here at Permissionless, head over to the Neo News Today YouTube channel.